Well, I love the, the Christmas uh, song you can sing all year round, but the, the refrain, O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. That's what we're here to do, and that's what this whole Christmas season and series is about, is adoring him. So you can say, well, who, who is it that we're adoring? I mean, who is this Jesus? Well, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Don't let that slip by too quickly. God came among us. God Almighty, Philippians chapter 2 says, he emptied himself so that he could be contained in a young virgin's womb. If you've heard the story a hundred times or you're hearing it for the first time, that's just beyond our comprehension. God in human form, born among us to live a life of perfect sinlessness, to die on a cross for our sins, to rise again and to offer grace to us. That's good news. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And then, who is this we adore? He is the Messiah. He is the king, the great king, not, not just a king. He is the king above all kings. He rules all kingdoms. His kingdom will never end. He is so much the king that we, would, that we should naturally adore him and sing his praise. That's who we come to worship. But we also come to worship one who was a baby. And sometimes at Christmas, I think we focus so much on the baby in the manger that we miss that he's Emmanuel and he's the Messiah. That's why we began the series with Emmanuel and Messiah to get everything in perspective. But he did come in flesh, born in a manger. Emmanuel, God with us, the Messiah born in a manger. And there's something joyful about life, about new life. I mean, think about it. If someone came to you, if a couple came to you and they said, we got good news to tell you. This is really, we've been waiting, but we're going to tell you now. We got good news. They say, we're pregnant, which is kind of generous toward the guy, but um, still, you know, they say, we're pregnant. What's the response they're looking for? How did that happen? No, not so much. They say, we're pregnant. It's like, oh, that's too bad. No, that's not what they're looking for. If they come to you and they say, we're pregnant, the response they're looking for is, yeah, congratulations, this is great. There's something about new life that's worth celebrating. And then when that child is born and breathes the air of this world, you got to come see the baby. You got to see a picture of the baby. It's just like, man, there's joy, there's excitement. And I get that. I get that because I'm a dad, but I also get that now because I'm a grandpa. And so when I got word from Michigan that my son Nate, who used to be a pastor here, and his wife Bryn, who used to be a worship leader here, who took a call from God to go pastor and serve in Michigan, when I got word that that they were pregnant with our first granddaughter, I was overjoyed. And then when the baby was born, I wanted to go see that baby. 2,000 miles away, but I'm like, I'm going to go see that baby. A little complicated because just at the beginning of COVID time. And so I literally go online to United Airlines... And I'm basically, you know, put in, I'm basically asking this question, can I get a flight from Monterey to Grand Rapids? And they say, no. Okay, can I get a flight from San Francisco to Grand Rapids? And they say, yes. So I guess that's allowed. So I book a flight. And I go to San Francisco airport. And I come to the counter and I'm like, you know, can I get on a plane? And they go, oh, yeah, you know, they check me through and I'm all good. I start walking through the, the hallways, the concourse areas. And I walk through three different hallways as wide as this courtyard just about that had not one human being in them. It was like end of days, apocalyptic uh, movies where it's like, you know, just there's nothing. Nobody, I'm kind of walking through the hallways kind of all by myself going, it's kind of creepy, but kind of fun because you get that little moving walkway all to yourself and that's great. But I, you know, I go and I go three different hallways like that. I, they put me on a plane. They fly me and then we stop in Chicago. I, and I got a little layover there. So I, I check and see, is there a United Lounge open? And because it's all COVID was super new. You didn't really know what was going on. It was just right at the beginning. So I check and say, is there, they're all closed except for one. I'm thinking, oh, this place is going to be packed. I go to it, empty. Not another human being. All to myself. Okay. So then get on a plane to go from there over to Grand Rapids. I get on the plane and there, besides me, there's five people on the plane. There's two pilots, two flight attendants, and a flight attendant who's flying over to Grand Rapids to fly out the next morning on another flight. I'm the only paying customer on the plane. And the two flight attendants come up to me together, and they say, we're really sorry, sir, you're the only person on the flight. I said, are we still going? And they said, yes. I said, then fine. I like being kind of spoiled and pampered. So I said, can I have some bubbly lime water and some pretzels? Let's party, you know? And they're like, great, okay. So they got me some snacks, and they became really, really friendly. We visited, so I get on the plane, fly to Grand Rapids. 
get into Grand Rapids. And I, I go to the, to the baggage area. It's empty, not a single person. And one turnstile is turning with one bag on it. Mine, a lonely bag going slowly in circles around. Get my bag, and I go to see my granddaughter. Empty airport, you know, empty United Lounge, empty plane, empty baggage area. But when I saw my granddaughter, Piper Joy Harney, my heart was full. There's something that happened. And that's what God does when we recognize that a baby has come into the world for you and for me. He fills our hearts. He fills our lives. God has come among us, born in a manger, a baby boy, God with us, Emmanuel, Messiah, Savior of the world. And that's, that's something worth rejoicing in. That's something worth celebrating. And so what I want to do in our time together today is to do sort of like a little, I want to go back, I want to go back to the Gospel of Luke, I want to go to the, the, the Christmas story, Jesus born in a manger, but I want to do a little bit of like Sherlock Holmes work together. I want to look at and think about together the, the, the when, the why, the how, the where, the who, what's going on here? I want to dig maybe deeper into the Christmas story than you might have dug, dug in the past and get some fresh perspective on what's happening on this first Christmas and how it kind of then brings joy and truth to all of us through all time and all places if we'll receive that gift. So let's just start that journey together. If you're a note taker, you'll notice on your Shoreline app or on the sheet that we gave you that there's a place to jot some notes down. And here's the first thing in sort of we is investigate what's going on there. The when. When was it that Jesus came? And I call it in the fullness of God's time and timing. God's time and time. It was in the fullness of time that Jesus came at just the right time. Look at me at Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In Luke 2, 1, we read these words. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Caesar Augustus issues a decree. And by the way, in those days when Caesar issued a decree, you did what he said or you were in big trouble. We don't want to get into what that means, but it was big trouble. It was bad. You did what Caesar said. So Caesar the king says, everyone go to your hometowns and we're going to do a census. We're going to see how many people there are, where they live. Now here's what I want you to understand. In the, in the ancient world, when the king made an edict, when the king made a set of command, and in our modern day too, kings, queens, politicians, presidents, emperors, whoever they are, there is a king of all kings, over all kings, over all leaders, over all political parties. There is a God who rules the universe. Can someone say amen? We have to remember this. So, so even as Caesar is doing this, he doesn't understand that the hand of God is at work. Why? Because the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. But Joseph lived in Nazareth. And had no reason with a, pray, with a woman who was now pregnant. She was engaged to him. Engagement's been a huge deal in the ancient world. It was like a marriage, but they weren't married yet. He never slept with her. She never slept with another man, but she's pregnant. That's another part of the story. We'll get to that one. Um, but, but Joseph had no plan to go with Mary to Bethlehem until the king had an edict to send them there. Well, Micah had prophesied, the prophet Micah had prophesied the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So God, sovereign over all things... In the exact time, has Caesar make this edict that they would then have to go there, and she happens to deliver right when she's in Bethlehem. What are the chances? If God's on the throne, 100%. Do you see God's hand in the timing of all of this? God is sovereign. God is Lord over all. And so they go to Bethlehem, and, and the Messiah, Jesus, is born in Bethlehem. Here's a question for you. Do you recognize that God's timing is surprisingly right? The when of things. We look at things sometimes in our life and we go, oh, that's the wrong timing. This isn't right. And then sometimes we, we get further down the road, right? And we look back and we go, oh, God's hand was in this. God is on the throne. We see his timing. Or what I suspect will happen for many of us is when we're in heaven one day with Jesus face to face and we can look back at our lives, things that we thought were so poorly timed, we're going to go, look what God was doing. He's writing a bigger story than just me and my timing. And I thought about Shoreline Church. And my 11 years as a pastor here, and how again and again and again, God's timing has been incredible. Here's a couple examples. My call to come and be the pastor of Shoreline over 11 years ago. Pastor Howie, the founding pastor of this church, you know, he, he knew that it was kind of his time to finish being the lead pastor, to step into a different role. He stayed on for five years and kind of partnered with me and was here with the staff in the church, but he knew his time of being senior pastor was over. 
It wasn't until he had finished that role and I became the senior pastor that he had significant health issues and he's still doing great and how he would never complain. He's got like the best attitude you ever see, but his energy level went down and his physical mobility is, is not what it used to be. And he would not have had the energy to do what needs to be done as a lead pastor. He didn't know that when he was playing the transition, but guess who knew? God, he's on the throne. God's timing is surprisingly right. My wife came to me, uh, this is years ago, and said, you got to meet this couple, Sean Stroud and Amy Stroud. She said, Sean, he taught at West Point. He's teaching at Naval Postgraduate School now. He, he brings young soldiers over to church. He loves Jesus. He's got a pastor's heart, but he's a military guy, but you need to meet him. And she kept trying to get me to meet Sean. I never met him, never got to meet him. And then we're traveling through Denver Airport. Our flight gets delayed. We're trying to figure out where the gate, you've know, got to go to the gate. But guess who else's flight got delayed in that same airport at that same time? Sean and Amy Stroud. What are the odds? 100% if God's on the throne. You following me? And Sean and I talked in that airport before we finished that conversation. I was talking about possibly coming on as a pastor when he finished in the military and being on our team. And you know how God has written that story. God's timing is surprisingly right. When this church, when the shoreline got this building, there was all this talk about having a courtyard right where you're sitting. And it didn't happen the first year, the second year, the 10th year, the 11th year. It just didn't happen. We tried to raise some money. It didn't happen. But a couple of years ago, someone in the church came to me, said, Pastor, when are we going to finish that courtyard? When are we going to do this thing? I said, when we have the money. We're not going to spend money we don't have. They said, well, what do we need? I said, about $600,000. They said, well, what if I gave 300000 And you asked the whole church all together to come up with the other half. I'm like, I think that would work. We got told all of you. People gave. We had the money. We did it. Just in time for outdoor services. What are the odds? What's the answer? 100% if God's on the throne. You following me? God's timing is surprisingly right. And can I tell you in your life, in those moments where you feel like, man, this is the worst timing, Will you remember who's on the throne? Will you remember? And one day, it might take till you're in heaven to look back and see how it all comes together, but God is writing a story, and you're a part of it, and God is always on the throne. The when matters. And then the where. Where was Jesus born? A place of humility. He was born in a place of humility. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born in a nice, clean house. He wasn't born in a hospital. He was born in a humble manger. And, and, and I want you to read with me at Luke 2, 4 through 7. L listen to these words and where he's born. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, right? So God leads through this whole census process to the town of David because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He had to go to Bethlehem. That was his family lineage. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Engaged, she's pregnant. We'll get back, we'll get to that still. But and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, right there in Bethlehem. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Not one guest room available for the king of kings, God in human flesh, the Messiah. Not one room available. Here's a question. Why would God slip into human history with such humility? Why would God come to a, kind of a, out to an outlying area quietly in a manger? Why, why would God do that? Well, I heard a preacher a couple weeks ago who preached a sermon in Michigan. He has the same last name as me. My son Nate preached in the Christmas series at the new church where he's pastoring. And he had an insight that just that hit me. He, and, and so I want you to think about this. And he pointed this out. I hadn't quite seen it this way before, and it's incredibly insightful. Okay, the God of the universe, the God who is sovereign, he orchestrated Caesar to do a census of the whole world and he could get Mary and Joseph all the way to Bethlehem at the very moment she's going to deliver a child. That same God timed everything perfectly, but that same God couldn't provide one room in a hotel. Has that ever struck you? God orchestrated a census, got him to Bethlehem to fulfill Micah's prophecy, and yet when they get there, God couldn't arrange one guest room? Really? Here's the question. What percentage would it be that if God wanted a guest room, he could have had one? What percentage would it be? 100%, right? He was meant to be born in a stable. He was meant to be born in the filth and the smell and the coldness. Because the one who came to be born in a manger came to die on a cross. And his whole life in between, he didn't have a home. He didn't have a place to rest his head. 
He came to serve and lay his life down for us from beginning to end. That wasn't an accident either. Humility. The where matters. The manger matters. God could have provided a palace or at least a clean bed, but God didn't. Why? Because Jesus came to lay his life down. Does that touch your heart? I mean, that, that, that's our God. The, the, the where matters. And then the what. What is happening when Jesus comes? If you're a note taker, I put there on your notes, what is a tense situation? That's what it is. This is a tense situation. Look with me at Luke 2.5. He, Joseph, went there to register with Mary, who, was pledged to, who he was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So here's the story. They're engaged. They have a formal engagement. Mary has never been with Joseph physically, sexually, never been with him, but she's pregnant. If you're a guy and you're engaged and the woman you're engaged to gets pregnant and you've never been with her, what's running through your mind? She's been with somebody. But she explains to him, an angel told me, it's really from the Holy Spirit of God. Now, it just these are normal human beings. This had never happened before. What's going through Joseph's mind? Yeah, right. Thank you. We, it's group participation. Yeah, right. Right? I mean, really? But then an angel comes to Joseph and tells him, this is of the Holy Spirit. His name will be Jesus. He'll save the people. You know, he's the Savior. He's born. She's a virgin. So Joseph tells all his friends and family, oh, it's okay. Mary told me, and then an angel told me, this was going to, and everybody says, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, no, th this is a tense situation. This is difficult. But this is what's happening. Sometimes God just shows up in the most tense and difficult situations. Here's a question for you. How has God showed up in strange and even confusing times in your life? In those times where you don't have the, all the answers, you can't put the pieces together, you can't explain to people, but God just seems to show up in those challenging times, in those difficult times. I'll tell you how God has shown up at Shoreline Church the last eight or nine months. I mean, we're, we're in a global pandemic. I mean, we're sitting, we're not in our worship, this beautiful worship center, which by the way, we took out all the seats in the balcony, we're putting new carpet in because it was disgusting, and we're putting the chairs back and we're fixing things up. One day we'll be inside again, but right now we're outdoors. We can't shake hands. We can't sit more than six feet, and we're following all the protocols. We're staying healthy. That's great. It's a weird time. But is God still working at Shoreline? We've worshiped every single week, mostly together, though those who can, online, in cars. We're still worshiping Jesus. Somebody say amen. That hasn't changed because God's on the throne. Discipleship. We're growing people in their faith. We have women's groups online, men's groups online. Our youth are starting to meet on campus, social distancing, outdoors. And you know what? I can tell you this. Young people right now need to connect with other human beings face to face. And we're, we're doing that. Right now, our kids are down at the bottom of this park, you know, one, two, three, four rows down in the parking lot, intense outdoors distance, but they're learning about Jesus. And, and our Christmas Eve services, all three services, we'll have children's programming going on. We're still growing in our faith. In the strength, in the strength, outreach. We're reaching out in different ways. Some of our outreaches have stopped because of COVID, but we started new ones. Other ones have grown. But can I tell you something? 2019, we had a lot of people make a first-time commitment to Jesus at Shoreline. 2018, we had a lot of people make a first-time commitment to Jesus at Shoreline. 2020, more than either of those years. Is God on the throne? Someone say amen. Amen. God is still, we're in the strangest times, in the craziest of times, God is still on the throne. And here's the key. We have to walk in trust. As crazy as things get, as difficult as things get, I don't know what the new year holds. I got a feeling by January 1, everything's not back to normal and you know, better. I'm not being a prophet, but I'm saying, I got a feeling there'll still be some stuff going on in our world, right? But can we trust God every step of the way because he's on the throne? Trust him all the way home, all the time. We had a couple in our church in Michigan, uh, Harold and uh, Betty King. I'm sorry, Howard and Betty King. And Howard and Betty, they actually owned the land the church was on. They'd sold it to the church at a really good price. They were right across the street in their old, ran in their old kind of farmhouse. And, uh, and, and Howard and Betty would go to Florida. They were snowboards. They go to Florida every winter. When the snow came, they left. And they came back from Florida one winter. And, and, and Howard said to me, I got to tell you what happened. He said, you know, we started driving back and it was supposed to be decent weather, but all of a sudden it got worse and worse. And then all of a sudden sleet and snow and freezing rain. If you've ever been in freezing rain, you're driving a truck and a giant trailer behind it. 
He said, I never prayed so much in my life. He said, the whole drive back, I'm going super slow. And sometimes you couldn't see it. I'm praying, Lord, help me. Lord, I trust in you. Lord, I can't, I can't make it. I can't. He says, I'm driving all the way through. We get to the, the border of Michigan. We come into Michigan. He says, I'm just praying, Lord, get me all the way home. Lord, I trust you. I put my trust in you. And he's just, he's praying to God, trusting in God, driving. He says, Lord, you need to help me. I can't make it on my own. They get on the highway 131, which goes right by the church. They say, Lord, I got to trust in you. And he's just driving. You know, he said, it's still pretty dicey, but we're making it all the way home. He says, I turn off highway 131 on 100th Avenue. On 100th Avenue, about 600 yards up, is the church on the left and the king's house on the right. So I pull off the freeway, Highway 131, and I pull on 100th Street. He says, I just kind of muttered out loud, Lord, I'll take it from here. <laughs> Bad idea. He says about 300, 400 yards down the road, right before their driveway, they start to drift and slide. They hit some frozen ice. I mean, I'm, I'm some black ice, and they slide right off the road into a giant ditch. They didn't get hurt, but the entire truck and the trailer all fall sideways into the ditch. He says, I will never again say, Lord, I'll take it from here. He says, I'm going to wait till I'm in the house, in my bed, under my covers, and I'm going to say, Jesus, I still trust in you. I'm not taking it, right? Trust God, whatever happens. Joseph and Mary, when people were taunting them, people didn't believe what they were saying. They believed what God said, what the angel said, and they trusted God, even though it didn't really make sense from a human standpoint. And then the who. Let's just keep breaking down this passage. The who. Now, I'm going to give you a, a small W who and a capital W who. Who was invited, small W. Who was the king and the Lord, capital W. But the small W, who was on the invite list to come and meet the, the Messiah who came to meet Jesus. Look with me at Luke 2, 8 to 11. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The angels go and invite shepherds to come see Jesus. Now you have to understand the first century, shepherds were not powerful. Shepherds were not wealthy. They were kind of common day laborers, just kind of just making ends meet. And if you went into a court of law in the ancient world in the first century, a shepherd could not be a witness. You know why? They weren't trusted. They weren't powerful. They weren't trusted. Common people. And God invited them to the manger to meet Jesus. Why? I believe this is the answer. Because he wanted you and me to know that we're invited too. And if all that God invited was the Magi and the wise men, you know, the, the Magi, the kings, and the powerful, but God invited the powerful insiders and the powerless outsiders, the respected and trusted, and those that you couldn't even allow to be a witness in court. Because here's what he wanted to say, everyone's invited to Jesus. You following? The shepherds, the wise men, and everyone in between. That's good news. I love when the Apostle Paul says, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, he says, basically he says, I'm the worst of all sinners. I persecuted the church. I had Christians killed. And God could use me? What's he saying? God can use anyone. God can use us. You're invited. You're invited. If you still are at a place where you say, I don't know if I believe in Jesus, I don't even know if I want Jesus, I want you to know, he says you're invited. His arms are open. He welcomes all that want to come. So here's a question. Do you know that you are on the invitation list? Do you understand that God says, you are welcome, you are invited. His arms are open, his heart is open, he wants you to come. And I encourage you to invite someone to Christmas Eve services who you think might say no. See, we usually only invite people we think will say yes. Who do you know that you're pretty sure they would say no thank you? But you're gonna get an invitation tomorrow, Monday, if you're on the Shorelines list, you'll get an e-invitation to you. You can just forward that to anybody. Pray about it. Who is somebody who would think, I wouldn't be invited? I don't know if I'd want to go. But we can invite them. You know why? Because God did. And he wants us to do the same, to be like him. And then the who, the capital who. Who was this baby? Who was this baby that was born in the manger? That matters. So look at Luke 2, 11 to 14. In Luke 2, 11 to 14, today in the town of David, a Savior, a Savior, the Savior, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, Savior, Messiah, Lord. You start to get the picture, don't you? 
This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Here's my question. Do you recognize who this baby was and is? Do you recognize that he is the Savior of the world? He came to make a way for us to come home. And many of us have. Many of us have put our faith in Jesus and we've surrendered to him and we've told him we believe in him and we become his children. But there's still people who say, I'm not there yet. One of the things I love about Shoreline is there's always lots of people who still aren't sure about the whole Jesus thing, but you're coming online possibly in the courtyard, but you're coming with questions. You're coming to figure it out. A friend loved you enough to invite you and you said, sure, I'll check it out. And you have to say that this one who was born came as a savior to save who? Us. To save us from what? From our sins. From our separation from God. That's the good news of Jesus' coming. That's the gift of Christmas, is that Jesus came to give himself for us. And that leads us to the question, why? Why would God incarnate? Why would God come among us? Why would God, what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2, why would God empty himself and come wrapped in human flesh. Why would God do that? Look with me at Luke 2, 11 to 14 again. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He came to save us. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He's the King of all kings. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and listen to this, and on earth... Peace to those on whom his favorite favor rests. Why did Jesus come? Because we needed a savior. We still do. He came because he deserved the glory and all heaven celebrates who he is. And he came because our world needs peace that only God can bring. Does our world need any peace right now? Oh man, does our world need peace. Jesus comes to answer all those questions. How can I be saved? In Jesus Christ, he has made a way. He has opened the door. And so I want to ask you, how do you respond? This series is called Adore. How do we respond? How do we adore him? How do we celebrate him? Well, I want to invite you to engage in adoration. And here's the first thing I'm going to do is I want to talk to those people who don't yet know Jesus. Your your act of adoration will be to go find Jesus, to search for him and say, I want to know more about this Jesus. I want to understand who he is. Open your heart to that. Ask good questions. Pray and say, God, are you really there? Jesus, did you really come and really die on the cross? One of my best conversations with my little brother Jason before he was a Christian was I said to him, Jason, start praying to God. Now, he was an atheist at the time. I said, Jason, start praying to God. I said, God, if you're really there, if Jesus really died on the cross and rose again, if you can really forgive me, if you want me, I said, just pray and ask God to show you. My brother not only became a follower of Jesus, My brother is now a worship leader. My brother's married to a wonderful, godly Christian woman. And my brother is a man of prayer because he has six children. I saw saw the gut shawls around here somewhere. What did I say? Yeah, yeah. So I know, that's nothing. How many you got? Seven. Okay. I thought thought it was nine or ten. They just are always moving around. They're hard to count. But but, but my, my little brother, one of the things he started doing was before he was a Christian, he said, God, are you really there? If you ask God to reveal himself to you, he will answer that prayer. He probably already is. He'll just let you recognize what he's already showing you about his self, his power, his love, and his presence. If you're searching and seeking, I encourage you to keep doing that. I'd encourage you to go to Shoreline's website, and if you're on the website right now, you can go to Shoreline's website and click the button that says Christmas, and on that Christmas tab, uh, there is, there is a, a Christmas message, about a 23-minute message. I'm going to share in just a minute the story, kind of, kind of the message of the gospel, but, but this is a 23-minute message that answers all the questions that it presents in a beautiful way, and you can not only watch that, you can send it to a friend of yours who's trying to figure out who Jesus is. That's on our website available to you. That's something we made right here at Shoreline Church. We made it for the, the boxes of hope that the women sent out, but it's for anybody who wants to watch that. And, and so, and then I also would say to you, if you're searching and seeking and you want to know who this Jesus is, call us at the church. Give us a call. And we will block out time for one of our pastors to talk with you, to answer your questions, to pray with you, whatever you need. We will make the time for anyone 
who wants to talk about who this Jesus is and how to take a step closer to him and maybe even embrace him and receive him. But I want to say, for those of you that are kind of say, well, I'm kind of ready right now. You know, I've I'm, I'm been around Shoreline or maybe I'm brand new, but it's Christmas time and I think I'm ready to receive Jesus. What is it that I need to do? What is it, what's, what's this simple story? And I can give it to you in about two or three minutes. It's not that complicated. Here's the, here's the story. And I'm looking, at, I'm looking at people who have become Christians this year and who shared their testimony. And I, I hope your life will change before Christmas. But here's the simple story. There is a God who loves you, a God who knows everything about you, who made you, who knows all your secrets, everything about you, and he says, I love you so much I'd give my life for you. There's a God who loves you. He knows that you need a savior because you're separated from him because of, because of your sin. All of us think things we shouldn't think. We do things we shouldn't do. We say things we shouldn't say. We don't live the way we should live. The Bible calls that sin, and that separates us from God. So God loves us, we're separated, and God said, I'm going to bring us back together again. That's why Jesus came. That's Christmas. God coming among us. And Jesus lived a life with no sin and no wrong, the only human being to ever do that. He lived out his entire life, no sin, no wrong. And he was nailed to a cross. And on that cross, he took our sins, he took our shame, he took our punishment, he took the judgment we deserved all on himself. And on the cross, he said, it's finished, it's paid. He bore our sin in himself and took it, and he died. And three days later, he rose again in glory and in power. And there's the last part. And this, for some people, this is the sticking point. The last part is this. We need to receive the gift that he's given. We come and we say to Jesus, I confess my sins, I confess my wrongs, I can't fix myself, I can't bring myself back to you, but I put myself in your hands. I give you my heart and I confess my sins, I receive you, Jesus, and I will take your hand and walk with you all my life and forevermore. We receive him into our hearts, and we take his hand, and we walk with him. That's the story. It's more true than anything you'll ever hear anywhere else, anytime else. It's the truth of God. And we can then simply say, then Jesus, I accept this gift you've offered, this free gift. I give you my heart, I confess my sin, and I take your hand, and I will walk with you through this life and forevermore. So if you want to do that right now, I want to invite you to pray with me. And for, for many people here, you remember the moment that happened. For some of you, it's been a long time. For some of you, it's been this year. But you remember that moment. For others, this will be your moment. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who are in the parking lot, in the, in the courtyard, and online. I pray that if there's somebody who says, I'm ready to take this step, that this would be their moment. And if that's you right now, I want to ask you in your heart right now, before God Almighty, would you share these words and speak these words in a prayer to God? Say, dear God, I finally get it. I'm ready to take that step. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for living a perfect life for coming here among us. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price, for washing my wrongs away. Jesus, I confess all my sins. I confess all my wrongs. I give them all to you. Jesus, you already took them to the cross. Jesus, you already paid the price. I accept what you did. I open my heart to receive you. And Jesus, I take your hand right now. Lead me all the days of my life. And one day, lead me into heaven to be with you forever. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, then just a couple minutes, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond by either meeting with Sherry and I after the service, if you're on campus and if you're online, I'll give you a way to respond by uh, texting something so we can follow up because we want to help you take those next steps of growth as you learn to walk with Jesus and follow him. Before I get to that, I want to just share some other acts of adoration. If you're a follower of Jesus or if you accept him just now, I want to encourage you in this next week, this is Christmas week, take time and look for where Jesus is at work or take ways to show the presence of Jesus by showing grace, by showing forgiveness. Maybe there's somebody all year long and for the last 10 years you haven't talked to, you haven't spoken to, they wronged you and they're paying for it because you decided they'll pay for it. And maybe this is the year you say, I will show the grace of Jesus. 
I'll contact them. I'll say, I'm sorry for my part, and you can tell me if you're sorry for your part, but I'm not going to hold this against you. I don't know what it is. You care for someone in your neighborhood. You serve somebody. You send out an invitation to a Christmas Eve service and show the grace of Jesus. But notice the grace of Jesus. Engage in his grace in this coming week. As an act of adoration, would you spread the word about Jesus? That's what the shepherds did. When they knew who it was, they, they went and let people know what they found out. Will you have the courage to, to reach out to somebody? Invite someone to Christmas Eve services. 1 o'clock, 2.30, 4 o'clock. Right here in the courtyard, in the parking lot, and online. Three services, all of them live. The weather's looking great. It's not even the morning, so it'll be, it'll be even warmer than this. It's going to be wonderful. So come and join us here or join us online, but invite someone to be with you. And when you get that invitation tomorrow, forward it. Pray about who you will send that to and invite them. On Christmas Day, make sure you adore Jesus. If you're by yourself, if you're together as a couple, if you've got your family gathered together, if you've got a family that's all in one home, whoever you gather with, just, just maybe take a moment and say, let's just lift up prayers. Saying, Jesus, I adore you because. And invite people to pray. Sing some Christmas songs that actually have Jesus involved in them. <laughs> Find ways. And there's actually, there's actually two different things that people have referred me to, two different uh, things that are on YouTube that are free to tell the story of Christmas. And we're going to put those on our website tomorrow, the links to those, so you can go look for those. Maybe watch one of those with some family and friends on Christmas Day. Here's the crazy idea. Invite Jesus to his birthday. Are you following me? <laughs> Make sure Jesus is there and part of what happens. And before I close this in prayer, I want to invite you, if you prayed today for the first time, if you're online, if you're here on campus, and for the first time you said, I prayed to receive Jesus, and you're on campus, Sherry and I in just a minute are going to go all the way to the back here by the welcome area. There's these big balloons. We'll be standing right underneath the balloons. If you are in the courtyard or your car and you'll come and talk with us, we want to give you a Bible. We've got Bibles in English and Spanish. Uh, we've got a great little devotional book. And we want to start walking with you in spiritual growth. To, to take Jesus' hand and walk with him means to start growing. We want to walk with you. And if you're online, you're going to see a number right there. If you'll just text the word believe, just saying, I, I put my belief in Jesus. Text the word believe, you see it on your screen, to that number. We will follow up with you and we'll make sure we get you a Bible and start walking with you on a journey of spiritual growth. And if you're here in the courtyard, or if you're at home, and you're like, I haven't received Jesus, but I'm curious, I'm checking it out, I got a lot of questions, I'm not there yet, we want to walk with you also. So you're going to see on the, on your, on the screen, uh, if you're at home, the word wonder. And if you're here, you can text the word wonder to the number that we have for all the things we do at Shoreline. If you text the word wonder, we will follow up, Sherry and her team will follow up, and they'll get you uh, some information, and we want to help you take those next steps of figuring out more about Jesus. If you're not there yet, it's not over. Just keep walking toward Jesus. I want to invite all of you to join me in prayer and just ask the Lord to meet us in a very powerful way this Christmas. Lord Jesus, we come together. We pray for those folks that just today for the first time have said, I need Jesus. I accept Jesus' forgiveness. I confess my sins and I want to take his hand and walk with him. For those that made that commitment today, Lord, I pray that this will be the greatest day of their life, that they will recognize that and see it that they will know that the angels of heaven are rejoicing and we can walk with them on that journey of spiritual growth. I want to pray for those who maybe didn't take that step, but they're curious, that they would have the courage to text the word wonder and we can just walk with them and keep discovering who you are, Jesus. And I want to pray, Lord, for all of us who have put our faith in you, that this Christmas we will be in awe and wonder of your sovereignty, of your power, of Jesus, how you came among us, born as one of us, to bear our sins, to carry the cross, to give us new life. We stand in awe of your glory. We adore you and we worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, let me give you a couple of invitations. Number one, at Christmas Eve this year, it's on December 24th, in case you're wondering. Christmas Eve, December 24th. Services at 1 o'clock, 2.30, 4 o'clock, online, in the parking lot, on campus. If you want to be on campus, register right away. The 4 o'clock service is almost full. The other two services still have some spaces, but please register for that. Children's programming, all three services. Spanish translation at the 1 o'clock service. And also, you need to register, so be sure you do that. And then... Uh, if you need prayer right now, please don't leave without being prayed for, whether you're at home or here. If you're here on campus and you want prayer, Pastor Dennis is right underneath there. There's a big banner that says, need prayer? That'd be a clue. Prayer is right underneath that banner. So head right up there. Let him pray for you. If you're at home, 
You're going to see an email. You text that email to us. We'll start praying for you right away. If you want to call, uh, if you want to email, text, or call, all the options are on the screen. We have people waiting to live right now to pray with you or also online. So we'd love to pray with you. And if you're new at Shoreline, we want to give you a warm personal welcome. So if you're here on campus, go back to the balloon tent back there and Patty's there. She has a gift for you and wants to answer any questions you have about the church and just introduce you to things about Shoreline. If you're online, will you text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen right there? And we promise to get right back to you, answer your questions, and make sure you know that you're welcome. And we just want to get to know you and give you a warm personal welcome. As you go from this courtyard, as you head out in your cars, as you wrap up at home online, may you recognize that this Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with you. He is the Messiah, the King that makes our hearts sing. He is the baby born in Bethlehem at just the right time, in just the right place, for just the right reason, for you and me. So worship him and celebrate him and have a Merry Christmas. Amen? Amen. 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 Our ushers are going to come and dismiss you. And so stay where you are. They're going to start walking. They have, they have the badges on. And make sure you keep your distance. Keep your masks back on. We're going to follow those protocols. So ushers, start heading out to dismiss people. And God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you back at the booth there if you want to talk with Sherry and I or with Patty.